Hello, what's going on? Um, it's your boy Funk Case. I'm here to react to the All My Homies Hate Skrillex video. Now, I just want to make one thing clear. This is not a reactionary video. This is not me going, ah, oh, what he said was terrible. And I want to reply to everything. This is not like a revenge video in any way. This is really kind of just a sort of my thoughts on what he said and just kind of like a very, I guess, neutral view of what I, what I saw. But I think one of the things you really have to take away from this video is that um, this is a guy that's kind of poured his heart out over what has happened to a genre he loved so much. And, uh, tr and believe me, I get it. Personally, I don't see this as some sort of like hate video towards the dubstep scene. I see this as a sort of like, kind of like a, like, like the nostalgia of my life has been ruined. Or even a look back from what I loved and how it sort of evolved is kind of like a look back on how his life was and how the love of his life had kind of evolved into this sort of dislikable beast, I guess. Like, I guess I consider it more as like a, a sort of look back to his past and how it's evolved. And again, you really have to take note of the fact that this is a guy expressing his opinion of how the scene is now. We're not looking at a man who's like literally just taking a shit on the dubstep scene. This is a man who's looking back fondly on memories and then looking forward to seeing how it's evolved and not liking it. And that's a man's opinion. I mean, who cares? Well, 1.1 <laughs> 1 .1 million views, I think a lot of you care. But this is going to be my uh, my my reaction to bit by bit of, of what I what I see in this uh, in this documentary. And I can't lie, I found this very interesting. I would also like to say if the guy who made this video is watching this, you know my thoughts on this. I've, rep I've responded to like to Naughty Steps interview. I actually commented on your own video itself. You know, kind of just saying that I thought this was very interesting, although there are some, you know, some questionable bits inside of it. But essentially, it was a very interesting insight into into one guy's, I guess one guy's youth. I think this whole thing isn't really like, what the fuck happened to dubstep? It's more just like, what happens to me and my love of something or something? I don't know. But anyway, let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> the classic video. Of all the electronic music genres which exist in our modern landscape, there are a few that manage to evoke such an immediate visceral reaction from people as dubstep. Somewhere in the last 10 years, dubstep has acquired the meaning of being something other than a genre. It's more like a ubiquitous oral shorthand for absurdity that everyone immediately recognises. Yes. A shrieking, piercing, overcompressed noise that's played for about two to three seconds in adverts or YouTube videos, enough time for a joke to land or for the YouTuber to pull a silly face or for someone to celebrate a no-scope headshot before the video cuts to something else. <laughs> okay, now you first have to understand that yes, dubstep has been and always will be in some sense a meme. It will be. It will always be looked at as kind of like this childish genre that people can use in a sort of joking way because it's come from and this is where we're going to touch into the whole into the whole thing is that it's gone from a serious underground dark expressive genre to opening up to a more commercial world and every single genre has gone through this this effect where it becomes something i mean you could say the same thing about baseline for instance if you watch lord of the mics back in the day we're talking i don't know what year it was i'm gonna say something like 2013 2014 you had baseline grime mcs in the battle and the grime mcs who were from grime saying that baseline was dead and now it's a huge genre so baseline was a joke and now it's not and it's like you know it's the whole thing the genre is just sort of go around in this big full circle where it's serious it's not serious it's used in certain ways and that's just a way of life in, in music. Dubstep is not just the butt of a lot of jokes. Dubstep literally is a joke, <laughs> being played only so that people will laugh. As it exists in 2021, it's probably one of the most obnoxious, tackiest, and stupid genres of music I've ever heard. <laughs> He's not wrong in a way, but that's that's kind of what we love about dubstep. So I'm just going to leave it like that. And yet, it shares a name with another genre that I happen to consider to be one of the most expressive and eclectic sounds I've ever had the pleasure of listening to. A genre which, when I was 15 years old, opened my mind to the possibilities of what electronic music could be and laid the foundations for everything I've listened to since. A genre which, no matter how hard I try, continues to occupy the most important place in my memories. That's literally the core of this whole documentary. You have to understand, once again, this is essentially a man's childhood at play. The man's nostalgia for something, a man's deep love for something that brought out something in him and the creativity of that genre was something that just blew his mind at the time. The whole thing is an evolution into how it's been ruined essentially for him. You have to put a level of understanding onto this documentary rather than just seeing as there's some sort of like big shit on for the genre. It's not quite that and I think he would definitely attest to that but it's just a man's opinion. 
How did it happen that the thing I used to love so much became the thing I now most passionately hate? Well, that is what this video is an attempt at sorting out. Get ready to be haunted by the story of how changes in the system led to me being musically homeless. This is why all my homies hate Skrillex. The title isn't as black and white as it seems. The title is just sort of a generalization about kind of how a lot of people feel in the older dubstep world, which again, I, I understand. And please don't take any, uh, any kind of like sense of arrogance from me. I only came in at 2009. That's kind of old school. It's really not that old school, especially if you're talking to this dude, because he's going to go through some serious years. But I feel like I've been around long enough to be able to comment on this. <laughs> so, yeah. When I was younger, I was into b-boying and I'd sometimes get a lift to breaking sessions with another guy from the same dance group who was same. 18 and had his own car. That was insanely cool to me as a 15 year old. We'd usually listen to music that you can break to. Eric B and Rakim, Freestyle Fellowship, Wu-Tang Clan, a load of old boom bap style hip hop from the US. But on this one fateful day, my mate brought this mix CD of a load of rave tunes. <laughs> it was mainly jungle, stuff like Dillinger, frenetic jump up beats that kind of pummel you with all types of percussion. But there was one piece of music on that mix CD which honestly had no earthly business being there. And this piece of music, unbeknownst to me at the time, would go on to change the course of my adolescent years. Again, exactly the same for me. I was in a friend's car and they played Eastern Jam by Chase and Status back when I was a big drum and bass fan. And that kind of blew my mind a little bit to the, the dubstep genre. And then shortly after that, I went to go see uh, Shy FX play in my hometown in the O2 on the Valve Sound System by Dillinger. And uh, he played Where's My Money Casper remix. And I was like, what? It started with a whimpering echo and cavernous rolling drums with all the high end chopped off, leaving a chasm of space in the mix before suddenly hitting me with this. There was instantly something about this track that felt completely alien to me. I'd heard wobbling distorted leads on drum and bass before, but I'd never heard them like this. It was an ambling, heavy-footed elephant of a beat whose drums pounded behind the bass in such a transfixing way that the whole thing became hypnotic. And this is essentially exactly how people's love for music comes about. There's one track that just sets off a switch in your brain, and it's exactly what happened to me. My mum was a uh, drum and bass DJ and uh, she had a specific room uh, in her house which she used to mix vinyl on and she would have people constantly over doing mixing and so all that sort of stuff. And I was a massive heavy metal head. I was convinced that I would only listen to metal and, de and death metal and grindcore and hardcore and all that sort of stuff. I was convinced of it. I was wearing the worst clothing you could think of. I had long hair down to my shoulders and I was just, I just saw my allegiance to that music. But one day I walked past the room and uh, my mum was playing or someone was playing Bandwagon Blues by Twisted Individual. And that was the first first drum and bass track which I went wow that was actually kind of sick what did I just like something from drum and bass and that love just I don't understand what happened in my head it just flicked a switch it just turned me into a drum and bass head and I feel like this is this is where this guy's going with the same sort of thing which is that switch one track it just takes one switch and your childhood is about to be formed this time the hook came back round it was more transfixing and I felt like I was sinking deeper and deeper into it I had goosebumps up and down my spine and I got that feeling that I now look back on as being particularly emblematic of being a teenager stumbling upon their passion project. It's hard to explain exactly the emotions I had, but basically in that moment, I was 100% certain that I would henceforth never listen to any other genre of music ever again. Exactly what I said. And for the next three years, that was actually pretty accurate. <laughs> There's a lot of lionizing narratives around the importance of experiencing dubstep as God intended it to be heard deep in the rave on a massive sound system. But reality check, I was a 15 year old living in the suburbs of Nottingham. My experience of dubstep did not come from going to raves. The few that I tried to go to, I wasn't allowed in because I didn't have ID. <laughs> However, I think there's something to be said for the way that I ended up becoming completely enmeshed in the dubstep scene anyway, in spite of not being able to go to any of the raves. My starting point was a dubstep mix CD called Dubstep All Stars 5. I went through the tracklist putting the names of every artist featured on this CD into LimeWire, which was like a file sharing thing back in the day. Oh mate, the amount of viruses I put on my computer from using LimeWire was just criminal. And LimeWire was so random. The results came directly from other people's computers. So you often got tunes with the wrong file names, yep. uh, tunes that had been ripped from vinyl and sounded like shit, often tunes which had the wrong artist names on them <laughs> because people had just cut them out of mixes and straight up guessed what they thought the artist's name was. 
You'll notice as well, it says next to it, 3.2 megabytes. If it's a three minute track at 3.2 megabytes, the, the bit rate has got to be terrible. One of the surprising advantages of getting into dubstep a bit later on in the scene's development like I did, was that by the time I went digging, there was already a massive wealth of material to explore. The stuff that immediately appealed to me was anything by Koki. His tune sounded so evil, like really horrible and predatory. His bass line sounded like they'd been squeezed out of a leaky pipe and he had all these glitched out effects he used to throw you off the beat in the background. Ground. Next came Scream. Uh, Scream at his best made tunes which I would describe as psychedelic. Mm. The leads were colourful as mm. hell and you'd hear these dazzling melodies being shot out of a cannon at you that would then be flipped and reinterpreted as the track went on. It's funny you mention those two because those are two very different entities in dubstep. When you're looking at Scream you're looking at some really atmospheric beats with a lot of deep bass lines and you listen to something like Koki which is, and I think he touches on this later on the documentary, which is sort of a bridge between that more energetic style and the more deeper style and I don't know how Koki managed to stay in that lane of more the more deeper style because his stuff was really energetic but he was kind of the pioneer of that sound at the time so it kind of sat in with the crowd but because he'd been around for so long you know he was in that area so yeah. I also soon developed a taste for Mala's deep orchestral echo chambers and basically if you're a dubstep head you know that Mala's music is basically the olives of the dubstep scene. If anyone says they don't like it it's just because their taste buds haven't quite matured enough yet. <laughs> I can't lie, I fucking hate olives. When they're a bit older, they'll be ready to appreciate Buried a Boy. It's really hard to- I, Can I just say, um, it's not about the track, it's about olives. I fucking hate olives, and I'm 35, and I still hate olives. Put into words just how much of a revelation all this was to me as a 15-year-old. Something that happens as you get older as a music fan is that you start being able to compartmentalize everything mm. you hear because it reminds you of the stuff you've listened to before. Mm. If someone plays you a footwork track, you'll immediately start comparing it to stuff by DJ Rashad. Whenever you hear a mixtape from a new rapper, you'll straight away start thinking, his flow sounds like Earl's, or his beats sound like Playboy Carties. And as useful as this can be to contextualize things you're hearing, once your mind is wired like that, you lose the sense of wonderment that can only come from yeah. having no idea how a piece of music was made. From hearing something so alien that you have no way of situating it in your mind, other than just knowing that you love it. This is the problem with engulfing yourself in music so heavily that you become some sort of like an analytical monster where you start comparing it to other people. And it's not like you lose a love for music doing that, you just become a different monster and this sort of drives you into this sort of dedicated beast in the genre and when you start doing that you become some some sort of like thesaurus or something, you know, like a wikipedia of dubstep where you can start saying he sounds like him or he sounds like him or he's got that element from him and him and him and that becomes less of a raw sort of love for the music and more of an analytical machine and that kind of loses an edge i think musically i've been there believe me um but yeah i totally get where he's coming from i remember in particular loafer's remix of the bug it starts with this echoey pluck and then hits you with this. I had Jeez. never heard anyone spit lyrics with a Jamaican patois flow before. I had never heard a bass like that either that hit like a quasi 808. This wasn't just a case of me hearing something new. It felt to me that this was a track which had been sent from outer space because I literally couldn't place any of the elements of the tune in my mind with anything I'd ever heard before. And yet I loved every bit of it so intensely. I eventually stumbled upon the Rinse Mix CD series and by extension Rinse FM, a pirate radio station where I could hear dubstep DJs playing all their new shit every week. And I think it was when I started listening to Scream's show on Rinse, Stellar Sessions, that dubstep stopped feeling like a hobby like how young and became looks. something more like a way of life for me. Scream was a great producer, yeah. but he had something else that came from a different place than pure production skill and made him a true star. And that was the fact that he was fucking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I have a horrendous memory of being at Outlook Festival. Uh, it was, pro I think, it was my first ever Outlook Festival, and I kind of had spoken to Hatcho my before in my life, but I'd never spoken or met Scream. I was walking through Outlook trying to get to the stage. I think I was playing on, or someone else was playing on, and uh, Scream and Hatcho were walking together, drunk as hell, through Outlook. And Hatcho went funny, and I went hello. And I'm bearing in mind, I'm still quite young at this point. I'm very new to the dubstep scene. I don't really know everyone at that point. I think this must have been about 2010. Hatcho rushes over to me, grabs me by the head, and just tilts my head and sticks his tongue in my ear <laughs> and then Scream does the exact same thing in my other ear. <laughs> I, 
I've never met Scream in my life, and the first thing that he ever did to me was stick his tongue in my ear. What a great memory. Hold up, hold up. You ready? We're cracking them. Crack them. Oh, I can't even describe stellar sessions. It was like going to your mate's house for your gas to see on a personal level, and your mate is whipping out the firest dubs you've ever heard. And he's as excited to play them to you as you are to hear them. And this is this is where the true love of dubstep, I think, probably opened up at this point. I think this is where things started to open up for dubstep because it wasn't just a genre that people played. It became a character. Scream was a character in a genre. I think he was slowly becoming a front runner because he was someone relatable. He was a guy that got a bit drunk and he got a bit whatever you know like and that made him lovable and that that created a face of dubstep if that makes sense it's not just a moody genre anymore it's a guy you can relate to playing a genre you love and it becomes a big family ah. Jeez, big tune just once i gotta feel the impact of that drop one more time I definitely had a bit of a parasocial friendship thing going on with Scream when I was a teenager. Yeah. I didn't know him personally. I understood that he was just a DJ who played music I liked. And yet at the same time, he felt like an older brother to me. Upon reflection, I can see that a lot of behaviors which are hard baked into my personality now as an adult, from the slang I use to the sense of humor I have, were probably directly influenced by Scream, emulating the way he used to talk about stuff and finding the exact same things funny. Hey, I hate Gabba. <laughs> I hate it, like, it could be forgotten about. I don't think anyone really care, like, there's a few people annoyed in Holland. <laughs> oh, Ollie, you fucking troll. Also, Banger and Scream's friendship. What the fuck? That was the most heartwarming thing I'd ever witnessed as a young dude whose only interest was really bass music. Again, something, a character, something to relate to in a genre. This is what created that family vibe into it. In interviews and on radio shows, you could feel this really sincere love that these two guys had for each other's music, and each other. Meanwhile, I was stacking shelves at Iceland every weekend and spending every single pound I earned on dubstep vinyl. Again, I can definitely relate to this. In my earlier days, I was working 69 hours a week doing two different jobs. One of them was working in a care home. One of them was working a fucking bullshit job doing administration work in an office. And every waking hour was me either playing PlayStation, making music or buying vinyl for me to play and going around my mate's house and playing them. It's just an amazing memory. I also got a cracked copy of Reason from my older sister his boyfriend specifically so I could start making dubstep music. Okay, so I can definitely relate to this. My mum, her new boyfriend, <laughs> had a cracked copy of Reason which he gave me and I was already making music like for fun on Music 2000 on the PlayStation and that's kind of how I started my messing around with doing music production, not, not seriously. But uh, it was Reason that really set things off. That turned into a more serious project. It wasn't just like grabbing loops on music and making random things. It was like, I can make my own drum and I can make my own riffs, make my own synths. This is crazy. And that sort of shaped me into caring more about what I did. And thus I began what would become a lifelong hobby of making beats. So although I was not in the clubs in the heyday of dubstep, I still very much felt like I was part of the dubstep movement and that the dubstep movement was a big part of me. And this is something you really have to understand. This is where this whole documentary comes from. This is from a guy who had a genre here in his heart and it changed. And losing that love of something or losing that original feeling of something that really brought you in when you were a young person is almost heartbreaking and I, and I understand it. It was something bigger than a hobby. It was the entire foundation of my identity. Some teenagers get into sports, others play video games. My thing was being clinically obsessed with dubstep. In order to understand how things started going west in the dubstep scene, you first have to understand what dubstep actually was. And I'm not talking about the Wikipedia definition. Yeah, it was a half-step club genre with big bass played around 140 beats per minute. No, you have to understand what dubstep really was. In the same way that romantic orchestral music emerged as an emotional response to restrained classicism and rock and roll emerged as a reaction to the anodyne family-friendly pop music of mm. the post-war period, yep. dubstep emerged as a reaction to UK Garage. Exactly right. He explains this so well that it really does tip on exactly how it came about, honestly. In many ways, UK Garage was the quintessential late 90s genre. Yep. The spirit of the music reflected the unbridled time of optimism that was coursing through the veins of the UK. 
80s austerity was over, young people had more disposable income than they could ever remember having, <laughs> and everything was just so colorful. By the way, this guy, if you're American watching this and you have no idea what you're looking at, this guy is called Mr. Blobby. He was a children's character, I guess. Um, it was a man in a suit, but he used to shout Mr. Blobby in this demonic voice and I was scared shitless of him. The culture of UK garage music, like everything else in the late 90s, was extravagant as fuck. Now, don't get me wrong, the people going to garage raves were the same as any other young people. They probably had no money and spent everything they owned whiling out at the weekend. But there was something about garage music culture that led to people behaving super extra. Like, people would go to the rave in a power suit and bust champagne in the middle of the dance floor. <laughs> it was glorious musical escapism, a sort of public spectacle that everyone in the garage scene collaboratively participated in. The garage movement brought people from Great Britain into a more colourful and aspirational world. And you can see this reflected in the promo shots that artists rolled out at the time. Yeah. They reflect this off-the-wall, vibrant lifestyle that the garage <laughs> movement projected. Even in the promo shots uh, of So Solid crew, yeah. the baddest garage MCs who were themselves a repudiation of certain trends in the wider movement, there are these residual symbols of extravagant fashion and ostentatious wealth. This was, I think, the rise of this sort of culture. This was the effective first rise of this culture. They were members of the garage underground, but they were also royalty. By contrast, look at the promo shots of dubstep artists yeah. which started emerging in the 2000s. It's literally a man in a hoodie and a hat in front of a wall. It's something completely different. And straight away, there's a lot of different visual information here. In front of a wall. First, look at the people. From the way they dress, to in the front way of they a wall. themselves, to the way they're framed in the shot. What's striking is that they are remarkable only in their unremarkableness. In front of a wall, in front of a gate. They're people who you'd pass on the street and not give a moment's notice to. In front of a wall. People who are no different in status or substance to you or me. And of course, dubstep producers make a conscious choice to frame their press shots in this way. Scream's first LP cover in particular has always struck me as the kind of photo that your mate might snap of you as a joke when you're pretty fucking spangled. But there's obviously something in this image of Scream being at odds with a crowded room that communicates a message about his music that he wants to put out there. Now, this is an important image because in the UK scene, dubstep was obviously seen as a dark edge. But when you look at things like the streets, these are relatable people who talk about relatable things. Scream is in a house party in front of a wall. <laughs> but this is a relatable feeling, sweating probably drunk in a house. This is what grabs you. This is the relatability of, of the music. Additionally, look how much setting we're seeing in these photos. The surrounding environments of dilapidated streets, desolate buildings and battered walls. The framing of the shots means that people are often dwarfed by their own surroundings. And again, this is a conscious decision. The artists are not just showing us who they are, they're, to a much larger extent, showing us the places they live in. And this is an important image here from Hamala, because if you look at the bottom, it says the credit from Red Bull Content Pool 2012. 2012? This is the sort of shot you think would be shot in 2007. This is 2012. This is quite deep into the into the new wave of the, of the dubstep scene. I was touring America for at least a year or so when this shot was taken, which means it was still being pushed at the time. And this is a great jumping off point to start talking about what dubstep was. The early pioneers of dubstep splintered away from garage because they were drawn to deeper, darker sounds. The movement that eventually formed would replace the kaleidoscopic escapism of the previous era with a clear, transparent magnifying glass through which the greyness, the moodiness and the alienation of modern Britain were no longer ignored, but reveled in. Bobby? Bobby, do you think he really did it? The lightning? Dubstep sounded grey, it sounded cold and isolating, it was an unapologetically intense and brooding genre, more prone to make you knock your head back and grimace than vibe like you would in a party atmosphere. It's that fuck off face, isn't it? It's that... That's what, that's what sets the scene, that's how the track is, is measured, how, how heavy is your bass face? In 2004, music journalist Martin Clark, aka Blackdown, wrote 
Grime is the voice of angry urban London, dubstep is its primary echo, the sound of dread bass reflecting off decaying walls. Tune your ear right and you'll detect the secondary echoes of King Tubby's dub excursions, Wiley and Jammo's Sino Grime experiments, Strange B movies, Metalheads at its peak, Zed Bias and LB's Dark Swing, Basic Channel's Decay and Detroit's Mournful Machine Funk. But most of all, you'll hear the echoes of modern multicultural London of Jamaican, African, Chinese, Indian, American, Cockney, and even Scottish accents. This is important because we look at grime these days and it's very popular. But grime is popular because it's a reaction to, you know, another type of music. Dubstep was more relatable than grime, which is why it blew up before grime, because there were so many different elements to um, the sound of dubstep. All it could do was grab you. Reflections come off crumbling warehouses, dirty tower blocks, endless row terraces, unhinged night bus rides, skunked out cars, and clattering overland trains. London, this is the defining influence on dubstep. That which gives it its tempered, edgy, compressed character. These are the echoes of a tense, intense city. This is mystical margin music. This is London. 2004. Dubstep was very much a product of its time and place. Following the Twin Towers, the London terror attacks, and the subsequent retaliatory war in Iraq, the atmosphere in Britain was far more grim, mm. and our cultural output reflected the change. Yep. We saw an influx of gritty films and TV shows which looked at the character of Britain through a more critical lens, exploring the emptiness of what it ultimately meant to lead a British working life, challenging grand narratives about British society in our institutions, and prompting some serious reflection on the underlying soul of the nation. Dubstep captured this shift towards gritty realism in music form. But what was so deeply resonant about the genre was its underlying ability to capture beauty in the darkness. The sound palette of dubstep was moody, and yet the tunes that came out of it often produced these uplifting, transcendental moments that sounded all the more satisfying because they came from a dark and brooding place. And if we're gonna talk about the capacity of dubstep to find beauty in the gloom, we're gonna have to acknowledge the artist who did that the best. As soon as Burial emerged, it was clear that dubstep had found its virtuoso talent, its Shakespeare, its Banksy. The artist that took the conventions of the medium and did something so special with them that they utterly transcended the genre. Burial's music fundamentally changed the way people thought about dubstep, revealing that the mournful, echoey aesthetic of the sound could be channeled into remarkably human songwriting. Now, this is important because he's going to touch more about Burial and his and his relation to dubstep, but effectively, if you've never listened to Burial, if you're talking raw, amazing, emotion music, but with a flow and something you can close your eyes to, this is the guy. More crucially, Burial's music challenged people's perceptions of what electronic music could be, full stop. His early albums have not aged a day since they were released over 10 years ago, a million percent. and still sound like some version of electronic music which has been intercepted by creatures from another world who've tried to replicate dubstep and garage, only to come out with a product which is way too ethereal and otherworldly to fit in with what we have here down on Earth. I love how he uses anime to express because the only way to express some of this music is to just play mental anime. <laughs> Every time I mention Burial to someone who knows about his music, I'll see this look pass over their face and I just know that they've got bare memories attached to his stuff. Yep. My best friend told me that as a teenager, he laid down on the floor and cried his eyes out once to the heart-wrenching vocal that comes in the last 30 seconds of Shell of Light. My girlfriend once remarked to me that she'd had a midnight walk listening to foster care and it suddenly dawned on her that the fading, high-pitched noises embedded in the mix were exactly like the fading lamp lights she was walking past on the street. And in my early 20s, I remember a particular New Year's Eve where we all danced to Homeless on the edge of a hill overlooking Sheffield. Burial's tunes are just so expressive and poignant in so many different ways that they sound like straight-up emotions just being beamed out of your own heart. He is definitely a... Burial fanboy, let's put it that way. <laughs> but he's not wrong. Dubstep was a sick fucking bassy club genre, but it also had something else baked into it. There was a feeling surrounding dubstep, difficult to put your finger on, but nonetheless always present. It felt like the genre had something to say about Britain, about life here, and the way we carve out small moments of peace in largely oppressive, monotonous surroundings. And although not every person who listened to dubstep back then would articulate this in quite the same way I am doing now, I can tell you that this feeling of dubstep standing for something bigger was something we all felt. 
I hope this gives you some idea of the fact that although dubstep was just club music, reducing it down to its genre tropes doesn't do justice to what it actually represented in mid-2000s Britain. It carried a specific contextual meaning that was hard-baked into its style and form. To hardcore dubstep fans, this meaning was an important part of dubstep's legacy, something that dubstep needed to honour. And this makes what happened next all the more painful. But before we carry on, uh, I would just like to say, please check out dpmoshop.com. We have all the Funk Case and DPMO clothing merch on this website. We have a massive sale on right now. So if you want to go grab yourself some amazing deals, we have some amazing merchandise um, lined up and uh, go grab yourself some today. dpmoshop.com. Go grab it. Bro step is a term which has been coined to describe a particular derivative of dubstep, which emerged in the early 2010s. This style of dubstep leans towards the use of melodic Ibiza sounding intros, big, crisp, heavy metal drums, and waves upon waves of distorted, modulated bass lines which frantically smash their way into tracks, leading to a listening experience of absolute chaos. The word bro step was originally coined by DJ Cozzy around 2010 and was subsequently popularized by a spin profile of the movement in 2011. Now, can I please just say, I have to explain something. I absolutely despise the name Bro Step. It is literally a genre name based from essentially people on forums who moan about the new style of whatever the music is. This happened in drum and bass. Back when I was producing drum and bass myself, there was a genre name called Clown Step. And this was when instead of the beat being like do 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 do, it was like do 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 do. Someone on the forum didn't like it and they called it Clown Step. And for some reason, it's got a little bit of traction, but not enough for it to be main name in the genre. For dubstep, however, one man coined the term bro step and for some reason it stuck and I absolutely despise that fucking name. Shame on you, Cozzy. It's an inherently pejorative term designed to disparage the people who listen to this type of dubstep as bros, yeah. cultureless frat boys who've never put in the work that the rest of us did, crying to the last 30 seconds of Shell of Light by Burial. The most popular artist of this subgenre and undoubtedly the one who played the biggest role in bringing it to worldwide acclaim is a producer from Los Angeles, America, called Sonny John Moore, AKA Skrillex. Now, I just wanna point something out. I need to give this man a huge shout out because not only is he a fucking good human being, musically, none of this is his fault, even though it kind of is. To say that Skrillex's music was not well received by the UK dubstep scene is quite the understatement. And I also just say, I also have uh, good knowledge to know that Skrillex knows the UK dubstep scene and UK music in general, actually, very, very well. This man knows UK music like you would not expect. Skrillex's knowledge is way beyond just scary monsters and nice sprites. This man is a genuinely amazing musician and he knows this music scene. Believe me. The UK scene hated Skrillex on a deep emotional level. We hated his screechy music. We hated his fans. We hated the essence of who he was uh. and what he stood for so much. Fate could not have conspired to thrust a more infuriating person into the role of dubstep's ambassador to the world than former first to last lead singer Sonny Moore. They're essentially just poking at him for being in a rock band and being the face of dubstep because it's essentially completely the opposite of what the genre was essentially. But I would also like to say dubstep forum was a shit show and uh, I'm glad it died out. And he was popular. So popular that henceforth, whenever dubstep was mentioned in a conversation, Skrillex's music was the default setting of what mm. people thought you meant. And that remains true to this day. Whatever dubstep was before 2010, the way in which the majority of the world identify the music, if they've heard of it at all, is via the particular brand of dubstep that Skrillex makes. When dubstep heads try to explain how Skrillex was able to become the biggest star of a scene where all the original fans ostensibly hated him, they have a tendency of spinning certain narratives about evil corporate America emerging from nowhere and somehow managing to corrupt the pure and beautiful spirit of the UK dubstep sound. There's a reason why this narrative is compelling. It fits with a preconception that we already have here in the UK about what happens to art and culture when it passes through the machine of American commercialism. Like what happened with films from world cinema and what happened with politics and what famously happened with The Office, our British comedy which unflinchingly showed the mediocrity and unfulfillment of working life which was slowly transformed into a show of wacky American hijinks where all the characters seem to be inexplicably living their best lives through working at a mid-tier American paper company. Why the fuck are they all singing Michael an emotional farewell song? He's the most annoying person in the world. That's the whole premise of the fucking show. <laughs> 
Now, you have to understand that this, it, the office is very important. This shows the two cultures of each country of the UK and the US. So the UK, we are very dry. We like dry humor. Blandness is funny to us in, if, if utilized properly. Uh, the American version of The Office, which by the way, is an English person and a person who loves bland, dry comedy, is my favorite office by far. And I know people are going, no. Believe me, the, U the US office is just too good. Anyway, let's stop talking about The Office and get back to some dubstep. The truth is far more complex than commercial America having its wicked way with our music scene. Mm. And as will become clear, the people who paved the way for Skrillex to become dubstep's first international superstar are by and large the very same people who most fervently hate him. The first thing to understand is that UK dubstep was never the orthodox movement that people like to think of it as retrospectively. No genre is ever the result of a singular minded push towards an agreed destination. It happened very organically, often mm. accidentally when art points in a vaguely similar direction. The battle to define what the leading tropes of a genre are is one which is always ongoing and even genre tropes that have long since been taken for granted are prone to being revised if other strands of the music become more popular. If you ask most dubstep heads where the genre started to go downhill, many will point you to one CD which was released in 2007, Casper and Roscoe's Fabric Life 37 mix. Now, this is tough to take because I feel like a lot of people consider this being the birth of the opening of dubstep. Now, we're not talking the commercialization, we're talking about the opening of dubstep where it became less of an underground word of mouth genre and it started to become more of a, like I say, widely known genre. This helps the growth of dubstep, even still in an organic way, I feel like. It doesn't have to be con considered only word of mouth and, you know, through LimeWire for it to be something that can be grown organically. Fabric 37 opened a lot of people's eyes to the genre that would never have heard about it otherwise. And that's obviously important to the genre. During the year of its release, this was the definitive dubstep mix and took the genre in a new direction, which was less introspective and more lively, party oriented, you could say. At various points, it features tunes with the types of sound design that one can retrospectively look at and find some similarities with the music that Skrillex makes. However, the shift that took place in the UK dubstep scene was far too endemic to be rationalized as the result of any one particular thing or person. Mm. It was something which happened on a far broader scale. If you want to understand the fall of dubstep, the time period which is most relevant to look at is 2008 to 2010, an era which I like to call the dubstep nether zone, because during this time, the sound was being pushed in so many different directions that it became completely undefined and amorphous as a musical space. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that we're looking at, I mean, if you're looking at a lot of these genres here, you're coming from deep medi down to sub freak stuff with Von D and then even more deep stuff like the zombie styles, Mensa and Joker having that Bristol sound at the time, Cyrus as well. These are all still very deep and meaningful styles of dubstep that he's still talking about. However, if there was one strain of dubstep that you felt you could point out and put money on at the time and say that right there that's the future of the sound it would be the music pioneered by a young bristolian called joker to all my guy purposes joker had completely different sensibilities as a producer from the ones that had defined the dubstep sound just two years previous his tracks far from big dark and brooding were glimmering monuments to a colorful and nostalgic past 90s gangster leads, yeah. tracks which paid homage to 1980s vocoder funk, some melodies that sounded like they came straight out of SNES games, and others that sounded like the thugged out version of the Blade Runner soundtrack. But it was all executed so beautifully that you'd be hard pressed to find anyone in the scene who wasn't immediately enraptured with Joker as soon as they heard his beats. And it showed in the amount of artists who subsequently emerged taking inspiration from him. Now I'm glad that Joker's getting a, a, a very good spotlight in this documentary because I really feel like he doesn't get enough love in the scene and especially not as much as he maybe as he used to. Absolute genius. We had Jemmy making the evil Pokemon trainer version of Joker's music, taking the gangster leads and dropping them into what feels like a long boss fight sequence. Guido, whose bittersweet tracks now sound like a UK forerunner to Clamps Casino's early work, in my opinion. And Ghostmutt, whose track Thoroughbred is just like, I think it's a Destiny's Child sample. And these cool as fuck blip melodies which run up and down all the way through the tune, it's an absolute vibe. This type of dubstep which drew its inspiration from 80s era soundtracks and old school video games coined its own name, 
Purple Music, words which were immortalized in the title of Joker's biggest rave track, Purple Sea. When I was introduced to dubstep for the very first time by a friend who was trying to convince me to make dubstep, he showed me Purple City by Joker, amongst other artists like 16-bit and uh, Bar 9. Purple City stood out to me a lot, and it wasn't actually that relatable to me in, in terms of the style, because I was into very, very energetic music because I love drum and bass and you can also hear the style of dubstep that I brought to the genre in 2009 which was essentially just slow I guess you could just call it slowed down drum and bass but this music just hit different in some way and it's a testament to the style at the time and there were so many other producers orbiting the purple sound who were so talented it was pretty mind-blowing how much creative juice we seem to be getting from this one niche sub-genre of a genre that was itself just a small corner of the UK electronic music landscape Purple music is the answer I would have given if anyone had asked me what kind of dubstep would blow up and take the genre to the next level on the world stage in 2010. But over the course of 2009, I slowly started realizing that the vast majority of new listeners who were flocking to hear dubstep in the raves had not come to hear purple music. They were here for something else. And so it begins. Now we must address the elephant in the room that I've purposefully left out of the discussion until this point. Whilst there were all these eccentric strains of dubstep popping off between 2008 and 2010, they were pretty much all being collectively overshadowed by another form of the sound, which was not just carving out a space for itself, but growing exponentially in popularity with each passing month. And the name that we had for this back in 2008 was dubstep tear out music. Tear out tracks were distinguishable for their chaotic energy which they created through hard drums and warping mid-range bass lines. When we say mid-range, what we mean is that the bass lines were specifically engineered to register highly in the mid frequencies, as opposed to earlier dubstep tracks where the bass lines were typically in the low end frequencies. Now, I can't stress the following point enough. If your only criteria for judging music is how deep the bass is, you're an idiot. There's a time and place for every bass line, and there's nothing that makes deeper dubstep tracks inherently better than the mid-range ones. They just have different functions in the dance. Now this, again, this is very important. This is, this shows his neutrality, despite being a very biased documentary. The fact that he said that is very important to this documentary. I personally love tear out dubstep tracks. When you've got a little groove going and squirmy bass lines popping off over the top, it's a madness. It sounds so sick to me. I get this instant grin on my face like, yes, it's time to go mad. But this is the but this is essentially what the evolution of dubstep did for him, which was it went from that dark, gloomy place. It was like a flower. It was like the seed was the deep, and then the flower opened up, and the mid ranges came in, and it put a smile on his face because it was something new. Ever since Koki's tune SpongeBob was being dropped in sets in 2007, it was Huge. clear that amongst dubstep listeners there was a thirst for these big tear out crowd stopper tunes where deepness wasn't a factor. And that's essentially where I came in, accidentally of course, uh, with my style of music, which was kind of a bridge between the deeper and the sort of mi more mid-range sound when I first came in was like Gorilla Flex, Make Our Day and tracks like that and it was kind of just something a bit different for the scene. I fell in at such a perfect time it was like the crossover to the genre so I got insanely lucky with my timing when I came into dubstep but again it was a complete accident. Writing for Pitchfork in 2007 Martin Clark wrote a recent dance floor fave in Chef and Malice sets is a new Koki dub possibly called Spongebob. For a while, parts of dubstep have been entering into a drum and bass style harder than thou contest, and SpongeBob certainly holds its own. The harder than thou camp often deploy heavy doses of wobbled bass lines, a style that Koki did as much as anyone to pioneer. And yet this tune takes it to the next level. Deploying dark, aggressive synths in rapidly fluctuating interval patterns, they overload the tune so there's little space left for other elements, drums, etc. The result, so called an alien, does differentiate itself from other run of the mill dark dubstep beats. But the question needs to be asked aesthetically, does dubstep really need to get that hard, dark, and cold? Now, I feel like, why is that a question? This is something that really confuses me because I don't feel like this is a question that needs to be asked. I feel like, why can't it get to that place? And the dubstep scene replied, fuck off, Black Down, you nerd. Cookies <laughs> beats are sick, mate. So no way this is gonna backfire on the scene. Uh. The question which might occur to you, particularly if you're new to dubstep, is what separates Cokie's beats from the ones that Skrillex makes? Why was Koki's crazy music embraced by the UK dubstep scene while Skrillex's crazy music was dismissed as brostep? 
I think that's a really good question because on the surface of things, tear out dubstep and bro step both do very similar things. This is again what I've always said. Why is it that Koki doesn't sit in that bracket because he writes really aggressive music but has always been considered part of the, the old school sort of deeper genre of the side of dubstep. And that's a really weird thing for me because I feel like because he's been around for such a long time, he kind of sits himself in his own little position within the sort of legends of dubstep. But why is it he's not considered part of the, even the pioneering of the, that style of genre? Or why is he not even considered remotely related to the harder style of dubstep? I think it's a very interesting situation there because I feel like a lot of the older dubstep fans don't want to lose that older edge for them, maybe it was like Koki was the, the sort of threshold of how hard they wanted it to go. And that's kind of like, if it went any further than that, then no, they hated it. For some reason, he never really got any of that level of annoyance from the scene that a lot of the people did when the even harder styles of dub dubstep came in. But I think there are some important distinctions to be made between the two mutations of the dubstep sound, which help to explain why they are differently perceived by old school fans of the dubstep genre. You'll have to forgive me for speaking extremely subjectively and broadly in this next section. Firstly, there are certain structural tendencies in dubstep production going back to the early years, which tear out dubstep despite having crazy sound design still tends to closely follow. A big thing is finding a groove and letting that groove sink in over the course of a track. Tear out producers drop mad bass lines, but they leave those bass lines to stew for the entirety of the tune. The drop feels crazy, but after 16 bars, you know exactly where you stand and you're able to sink into the groove as the track develops. This is very prominent in today's rhythm. We'll probably touch on this a lot more later, but rhythm essentially is exactly that. It's the, here's the track and roll it. And now I, I know a lot of people have issues with, with rhythm these days and I understand why, but also you have to understand that rhythm effectively is what houses in dubstep. It's a simple flow, which is driven through a track consistently, which you don't have to just sit, sit there and analyze for four minutes. And that's the beauty of the style is that it's just the simplicity of it is just what you can enjoy. You don't have to go, wow, that bass, that bass, that bass, that bass, that bass. And it's a new bass every five milliseconds in, in a track. The simplicity is what makes it, and that's effectively the love to it. Even if it's a fairly mad sound being played. By contrast, if you listen to bro-step tunes, you'll quickly realize that the people who make them can't seem to settle on a single groove for any amount of time. Yes, agreed. But this is the older style of dubstep we're talking about. The older style of dubstep was, and I was a part of this, I must admit, it was effectively like an ADHD genre where things just had to start going a bit crazy. Every four bars, a new iteration of the bass line comes bursting through the door, leaving only the massive kick and snare holding the tune together, which makes it virtually impossible to find a groove. That's why you see bro-step crowds giving up on dancing entirely and just headbanging to the kicks and the snare hits. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're already like this far in and he's already targeting the headbangers. That's all the track is giving them to latch onto. The other difference between tear out dubstep and bro step is the trimmings which go around the edges of a track, essentially the intro and outro. Tear out dubstep again follows the mold of old school dubstep production in striking a tone which is murky grey. The intros are droning ambience or a drum beat or perhaps the hint of a few bass notes from the drop. I think this makes tear out dubstep beats feel like they exist in the same aesthetic universe as the old school dubstep classics. By contrast, bro step tunes strike very bold tones of fluorescent crimson and deepest darkest black on their way towards a drop. Bro step producers have this tendency of saying the quiet part out loud. For example, instead of creating sci-fi ambience, they'll have a literal alien who comes in and delivers a monologue like I am an evil alien and I have a base weapon and I am going to shoot it at you. Now, obviously, he's pointing at excision, as you can see here. But the fact, you know, what's funny about that whole situation about him explaining bro step is that he had Flux Pavilion on the intro there. Flux Pavilion, for me, I couldn't even class as bro step. Flux Pavilion is a whole different level of musicality that we really can't even touch on when it comes to this style of genre. Power up the base cannon. And like, instead of leaving empty space in the mix, so the drop comes with a surprising impact, Brostep producers will make the drop a surprise by making the intro an entirely different song. Like, oh, a 90s rave tune. Oh, Are you enjoying on. that? Psych. Dude. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, he's really tearing into like a circus right now. He can't really tear into Sweet Shot by Dr. P. I mean, he can. That was merely a genius trick so that you'd be surprised by my baseline. Oh man, it's like, it's weird because he's like a young boomer. Like he's, it's like he's so upset with the fact that people have created something which is a bit more, you have to be alert from the beginning rather than here's some weird ambient shit and then suddenly here's a drop. They both work in their own way, but you don't have to, you don't have to like poke at it like, oh, you're only making two different tracks. Like one's a rave track and one drops into a whistle. What are you doing? So I guess you could say that whilst the baseline sound design of Tear Out Dubstep differentiated it from the beats you'd hear in 2006 from people like Mala and Lofa, the structural tendencies and aesthetic of Tear Out Dubstep situated it very much in the same sonic universe as its predecessor genre. By contrast, Brostep appropriated the one craziest thing about tear out dubstep the baseline noises and proceeded to throw everything else out the window with the result that old school fans could no longer see any trace of the genre they liked in the beats that bro step producers were making now i don't see an issue with that because that's just a different style of dubstep but i get where he's coming from it is true that both Koki and Skrillex achieved success through experimentation with crazy mid-range bass design, albeit on different respective levels and with different audiences, so I think it's worth exploring what was appealing to people about that specifically. Tear out tunes like Spongebob by Koki enjoyed several advantages over deeper tunes which had their bass low in the mix. The first advantage we've already talked about, tear out tunes were rave dynamite, however another advantage they enjoyed was entirely practical. You could hear Koki's bass lines on any speaker. You didn't need to be at a rave. You didn't need to be in a car. Yep. You didn't even need to be wearing headphones. You could literally play SpongeBob out of your laptop and you're still hearing that mad growling bass. It still sounds crazy. I grew up um, sitting on buses going around town and a lot of the kids on these buses would sit and play like pop music or garage music through their phone. And in these early days, phones with speakers were coming more and more prominent, which is why dubstep had to evolve. Like dubstep couldn't be on a bus, let's put it that way. If you compare it to tunes like Eyes by Mala, which dubstep heads typically venerate as being the Huge higher track. art form of the sound, Huge. there's no comparison. Eyes sound so weak on tinny speakers. It's like there's nothing there. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of like that enjoyability factor of this, that style of music is completely lost unless you have some sort of a sound system or some level of good headphones. And I have heard Eyes on a Function One sound system. It's insane. You feel like you can see the waves of sound in air. It really is an out of body experience, which nothing else even remotely compares to. I have a really amazing memory of being in my hometown uh, at a show called Dubnium and it was the Iration Steppers sound system. Mala was playing Joker dub plates, he played Eyes, and I can't really describe, like, the vibe in that room was so insane to that style of dubstep. It really opened a lot of my eyes to a lot of how dubstep can be in different levels of energy in a track. It can still provide the energy to the crowd. It's not essential, but I think it's important to understand the levels of dubstep and what has been and what will be. You don't have to know the, the roots and history of the dubstep, but it's probably quite important to, and I think for good reason. But most people don't listen to music this way. They have little speakers that come as a package deal with their computers, yep. and they are way more likely to be impressed by something that sounds powerful on these tinny little fuckers than something which they are told would sound incredible if only they had the right equipment to listen to it. How do you expect to sell a genre to someone when you have to kind of just promise to them that, oh my god, this sounds great on a system, I promise, rather than, hey, check this out, and then play it on the laptop. And it wasn't just listeners, but producers who had limited access to the studio monitors you would need to engineer bass heavy music. It's no accident that the kinds of mid-range bass lines which took off in Tear Out Dubstep near the end of the 2000s were very similar to grime music and bass line, genres pioneered by young producers who suddenly found themselves with access to programs like Fruity Loops and Reason, but didn't have good speakers to blast their tunes on. Filling up the whole mix with wonky growling bass lines was a great way of achieving impact with an audience who would be listening to the tunes in their cars, on phones, and on laptops. And another thing to take away from this as well is that not every single club will have a banging sound system. I know it sounds ridiculous. Not every club has a banging sound system. I can't tell you the amount of shows I've actually played where I've turned up 
by the way, a dubstep artist and their sound system has lacked sub or even had none at all. You can still on some level enjoy dubstep with the more mid-range style on a system with no sub because you can still hear the elements. If you were to say to Mala, come to my club and he turns up, plays Eyes VIP on a system with no sub, it's going to do nothing. Although tear out dubstep tracks like Spongebob by Koki were loved by the UK dubstep scene, there came a point where opinions began to shift on the type of dubstep that went hard for the sake of going hard. Mm. Adventure, the reason why the shift happened had little to do with the tracks themselves, although they did get more annoying. Okay, I'm not entirely sure why we get a mention here because Circus came with a lot of different types of music. And I get it. I wrote really obnoxious music and still do. Cookie Monster wrote a lot more wobbly stuff, but it was still fairly obnoxious in comparison. Dr. P obviously wrote a lot more high energy stuff, but we had Flux Pavilion writing really amazing anthems like I Can't Stop and Cracks Remix and everything like that. So yeah, but dude, you're a bastard for making us. This is the only thing we have in this whole documentary and you say we're annoying. <laughs> I resent that. Annoying. It was more to do with the regularity at which these tunes were getting played in dubstep sets. Previously, tear out tracks had always been held in equilibrium by other variations of the dubstep sound. The electricity of hearing a tune by Koki in the rave came from the fact that it would explode out of nowhere, straddled on either side by tunes which were not by Koki. It was the variation, the way that dubstep mixes would switch up to something mad and then simmer back down to more introspective dubstep that made Go Into The Night such an immensely enjoyable wild ride. And that's still relevant today. That's still how things work. Although obviously it's a lot more aggressive, especially where I play. But between 2008 and 2010, the ratio of tear out dubstep to everything else was becoming skewed. Instead of hearing three Koki-esque bangers over the course of a set, you'd hear 15, 20, sometimes people playing entire sets composed uniquely of hard tear-out tunes. Again, something that I've got a little bit of a problem with, because all the people that you love, or I say all of them, a lot of the people you love in this documentary are directly contributing to this style of music. I have a prominent memory of Screaming Benga coming to my hometown and playing in the old fire station and they dropped The Future by Trolley Snatcher and I cannot tell you how hard that went off in a rave. So where does the blame lie? Does the blame lie in the artists who have made the music or does the blame lie in the people that you prominently love who have contributed by playing this to the masses? It's an interesting uh, little situation. As I've said, I love rowdy beats. But do I want to hear Spongebob mixed into Don't Mess About, mixed into the Where's My Money remix, then Rock the Bells, then a Skeletor, then I'll Cut You, then Serious? No. Okay, this I get you. Uh, believe me, I get you. Some people do like that, obviously. And that's why Dubstep is now in this favor. But this is a similar argument to what I like to say these days. When you watch my sets, for instance, I play a lot of angry stuff, but I mix the vibes up a little bit. I play a lot more rhythmy style stuff and then I'll play some musical stuff and I'll try and switch it around. It's not one hour of craziness. I do see value in playing different types of dubstep and different vibes. But again, it's each to their own. It's like being tortured with an array of slightly different chainsaws and none of them end up packing the punch which they should because there's nothing to differentiate them from everything else being played either side of them in the mix. Kind of true, but it's not quite as black and white as that. I think that's a very elitist way of thinking about it. And this is what was happening at the dubstep nights. Full sets stacked full of tear out tunes led to a fatiguing experience where the moments of electricity no longer packed the same punch. What I didn't understand at the time was that there was actually a force outside of the DJ's control that was having a massive impact on their tune selection. And that force was an anti-smoking law which came into force in summer 2007. Now I would never have pointed this situation out but I think it's fairly true but also not. We'll get into this. I cannot tell you how much I love the fucking smoking ban. The amount of nights I'd gone to, the amount of club nights I'd gone to where, where people would smoke inside the clubs and I would wake up in the morning morning and my room would be stinking of stale smoke, cigarette, cigarette smoke. That was the absolute worst. And also planes. How the fuck did people survive with people smoking on planes? It's just, it's just nasty. As a non-smoker, my reaction to the banning of smoking in clubs was one of complete indifference. But unbeknownst to me, smoking played a big role in dubstep events. People liked being able to come to the rave, pick a spot to chill in and blaze throughout the night. Experiencing DJ sets in this way, where you stand in one spot and don't move, it's like you're signing up for the adventure the selector wants to take you on, whatever that entails, whether it's weird, deep, ambient, whatever. Effectively, you end up experiencing music as a journey rather than a roulette wheel, which you hope will throw you some bangers. However, the smoking ban changed this dynamic. This is what Mala had to say about what he observed happening in the scene. I think the smoking ban did have an impact on the sound and the dances. 
For a crew with hard smokers, what happens with a smoking ban is that you have an audience that aren't focused for the whole session. You're getting people coming in and going out, and that was disruptive to the dancers because it had the effect of shortening people's attention spans. High impact and quick tunes get the quick response. Yeah, I think that's fairly true. I do, I'm, I'm not sure the smoking ban really affected the dancers as much as maybe this is entailing but i do feel like people would go outside if they got too hot and other things but yeah before that yeah everyone was just stuck in the clubs honestly. this really cuts to the heart of the issue djs didn't necessarily want to play sets of wall-to-wall tear out tracks but many of them saw it as the only way they could actually keep people in the clubs during their set rowdy bangers pumped the room up and made people feel that they would miss out on something if they stepped outside so DJs kept playing them. People often think of DJing as a one-way street where the DJ decides what songs they're gonna play and the crowd vibes to their selection. But in reality, DJing is a lot like, well, it's a lot like having sex. You have your own specific tastes and preferences which you want to try out, but at the end of the day, your main goal is keeping the audience happy. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, can, I can definitely agree with that. But at the same time, how much do you want to sacrifice what you stand for to keep a crowd around? Does that generate a fake fan base? There's a lot of questions that can be had from that, but yeah, generally I agree. If you're doing something and they like it, keep going. Why would you stop doing something that gives them pleasure? If you do something that you really like, but they're not into it at all, then maybe save those eccentric techniques for another occasion. Okay, so yes. I do agree with that. I also disagree with that because I feel like if you're an artist and you really want to push what you're about, you have to just stick to what you do. That level of stubbornness, I guess you would call it, would generate a more loyal fan base. If I was to turn up to a show and play what I play and the crowd would leave, I'd go, fair enough, the crowd went into what I'm doing. That being said, there's probably what like 10% of that crowd who were like, that was literally the best set I've ever seen. I'm going to tell literally everyone I know about it. And that in turn generates a loyalty to you and brings you a proper fan base. So I don't know this is something i think about a lot really i don't think i'll ever change what i do to suit a crowd i also know that keeping a crowd happy is pretty essential so it's kind of a two-way street your ultimate goal here is making sure other people are happy for the duration of your performance what was happening in dubstep raves was that djs were getting a pretty clear yes signal every time they dropped a tear out beat which made the djs less and less inclined to deviate from that winning tactic and the effect which this dynamic had on the scene was massive. It wasn't lost on young producers that like 95% of the tracks receiving heavy rotation in the raves were the rowdiest beats of the sound. So logically, that's what everyone started making. <laughs> we quickly went from having just a few dubstep artists who were known for tear out beats to having a scene which was so full of dirty modulated bassline tunes that you were hard pressed to find anything else. What's really interesting here, I must say, is that there's some names in here which I feel like really don't deserve to be here. Sure, you've got the, you know, the crazy excision stuff, the Datsic stuff, 16-bit was crazy. Rezo was more technical, but then the others was like more of a bouncy sound rather than in tear out. And when I look at you by MLK, I just can't really see that being mentioned here in the same light as something like a release by Bar 9. I feel like some of these pointing outs in this situation here also like Nero innocence and, and that probably misrepresented in this video a little bit but again this is another man's opinion how do you stand out when everyone is making hard music you have to be the hardest the harder than thou competition which Blackdown had warned about when he first heard Spongebob by Koki in 2007 was coming true. Everything mentioned with Circus Records is in a negative light. I hope you're watching this, you bastard who made this video, because you, you're very unfair to us. In a way that was far more horrible and tasteless than even he could ever have imagined. Horrible and tasteless. Now, I do think <laughs> he's if he is watching this, he's probably going, ah, oh, those are the wrong words. Or he might be saying they're the right words. I don't know. A lot of aggression towards us, yeah. As this transformation of dubstep music was taking place, the people coming to the raves were also changing. The crowd of people who went to dubstep nights in the early days were a mix of dreads, art school students, weed smokers and music nerds. And the vibe was everyone experiencing the music in their own headspace. So dubstep nights felt like a refuge away from commercial club culture. By 2010, that had massively changed. Without going into too much detail, it felt like the mainstream club commercialism, which dubstep had been a safe haven from, had finally caught up with it. One thing I do have to say is that where I do agree with what he's saying, I also disagree. There are always going to be
going to be different generations of people that go to these shows and end up stop going after maybe getting bored or moving off or something. For instance, I live in Bournemouth and it's a strong university town. A lot of the university kids come to these events and after their university days are done, they go back to wherever they live and the new wave of university kids go to the new shows. This kind of shows reflection on the genres that are being played in our, in my town, which is effectively the coolest genres at the time. Upstep was a part of that, but do these people keep coming to the Rays five, ten years long? Or are the people that you're talking about in this video the people that sort of grew out of it naturally? Not even through the whole tear out being a bigger thing. Were these people people that came to the rave, did what you were saying, but then grew up and ended up going to different raves or not going at all? Or did they get a bigger career? Did they do well in their job? Did, did they not have time to go to these shows anymore? These are important questions which really need to be added to the mix of what he's trying to portray here rather than being like music changed, so did the people because it was ruined. Do you get what I mean? It was more exhibitionism. Guys who uniquely turned up to hit on girls. People taking video for their Instagram. All kinds of stuff which just makes you feel like you're in some mainstream student night but with slightly harder music on the sound system. Yeah, agree. I don't like the whole Instagram culture and how prominent it became in the scene. That being said, that was a natural evolution to the youth and apps being bigger and bigger through phones. We started off these nights with phones that couldn't do that and now the phones can. So the evolution of what you're saying really is just something that just happened rather than being because of how dubstep was evolved. And the new fans had come to hear exactly the type of beats which by this point I hated with a passion. Even tear out DJs like Rusko were left with a bad taste in their mouths from the kind of crowds coming to the dubstep event. Yeah. And it's funny because he does kind of slot Rusko in the same light as someone like me, which I find a little bit unfair to Rusko, for instance. Because Rusko didn't bring his sound of angry loudness to the scene. He brought his bounce to the scene. But for some reason, he's linked to us in this way. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Bro step is sort of my fault, but now I'm starting to hate it in a way. It's like, I kind of took it there and now everybody else has taken it too far. It's not heavy metal. I think, I've, again, I've been in America, I've had touring for a long time, and even more so, they just want it as hard as you can. They're like, let's go, I want you to melt my face off tonight. Like, play the hardest, hardest you got. That hasn't changed. People, people saying, the exact same thing in different words. I don't actually know if Rusko has the same mindset now as he did back then. I think maybe he's evolved. What I do know is Rusko's probably gone to drum, drum and bass right now, and I don't know if that's in effect of how the scene has evolved in dubstep right now, but this is where we're at. And I'm like, it's not about playing the hardest, hardest tracks for an hour and a half. It's like someone's screaming in your face for an hour. You don't want that. Yeah, I agree. And this is exactly why I like to mix things up in my set. This is why I say that the change which took place in the dubstep scene can't be whittled down to any particular song, mix CD or artist. It was happening in the very DNA of dubstep itself. I Yes, uh, where, where I agree where it was DNA based in dubstep, I also agree that it was the natural evolution of how people were in life in general, honestly. With the genre taking on a whole new fan base and significant vacation as a form of music. There came a certain pivotal moment for me in early 2010 when after walking from room to room at a dubstep night for what felt like hours hating every minute of it, I had to admit to myself that it was over. I'd harbored this secret hope that bro step would prove to be a fad that might pass but it was just getting bigger. And although it was just music, the decision to stop going to dubstep nights was heartbreaking for me. I still love dubstep. The dubstep nether zone era had been the best time to be a dubstep listener, with so much range and creativity amongst the producers that it was still difficult for me to fathom how bro step had ended up coming out on top. For me, this is quite an easy answer. Dubstep needed to evolve to be bigger. Dubstep would not be the main genre it is today if it had stuck doing the same style of music that he loved, for instance. For a genre to become a main genre, it has to commercialize in some way. You look at drum and bass, it's a main genre. You look at house, it's a main genre. Garage, bassline, grime. These are all genres that have evolved and effectively become main genres through commercialization. And that's what's made this whole genre part of the main genre list. Dubstep is a main genre now. And I think that's where his trouble lies. I think his trouble lies in the fact that he, as essentially an elitist fan of the dubstep that he loved, it was opened up to too many people and brought in as a main genre. But again, the question has to lie in what he just said, which was he walked around different rooms in a dubstep show and hated every room. Now, the question I have for that situation is, did you see the lineup? Did you go into that club hoping you would like the music that you'd seen on the lineup? Or were the artists that you loved playing the music 
and that effectively killed it for you? Or did you just grow out of it and you didn't realize and this was the sort of moment where it all kind of clicked for you? I'd invested all my time and energy into dubstep. I'd made lifelong friends with people through it. The realization that I could no longer be part of a scene that had been my home for the last three years hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt like I was being forced to surrender part of my identity that I would never get back. See, this is essentially, this is where I, I understand where he's coming from. This was his life and this is what he put his soul into and this is what he spent his days loving to death. But effectively it was gone and it's hard to take that because you feel like it was taken from you in some way. I think we can all really kind of relate to that in some way. And that really sucked. When Skrillex emerged in 2010, the rage which flowed from the UK dubstep scene towards him happened not because he defied some unwritten rules about what the trope of dubstep should be, but rather because he personified everyone's worst anxieties of what we could already see happening all around us. The dark underwater dance hall we once all fell in love with had become a monument to exhibitionism. It no longer held up a mirror to the world we lived in. It defiantly turned away in favor of meaningless absurdity. And the massive popularity of Skrillex was glowing, irrefutable confirmation of the fact that we had lost the dubstep culture war. We had lost the dubstep culture war. Those are very interesting words he's used there. He's talking from a sense like it's like two different armies. You got an army of deep elitist dubstep lovers and an army of the brand new fans who liked the loud rebellious sound. And he's effectively saying he lost, but what have you lost? Had you lost the love of the music, would your love have continued if it was the same music style that you loved previously? Or like I say before, did you just grow out of that style of music? Or had you listened to too much of the same style of dubstep maybe? I don't know. Again, this is a journey through a man's effective career as a dubstep lover and listener. And while I keep saying it, it is very important to, to remember that. This is not the Wikipedia of how dubstep died. This is a man's love for something effectively dying through the evolution. Skrillex was the cold bucket of water to the face that made us realize that the enduring legacy of dubstep would not be the memory of it which we had in our minds. It would be the parts of the scene which we'd all been wishing would go away. But again, this is not true to me. Your memories are still your memories and other people's memories are what you're effectively showing. Your memories will never go. Your memories will always stay. You're showing a lot of these memories in, your, in this documentary. And we despised Skrillex for putting that last nail in the coffin. It was easier to be mad at Skrillex than it was to be angry at the ambiguous sequence of events in our own country which led to music tastes changing, club dynamics transforming, and producers adapting to the new climate. That is exactly the perfect way to put it, and I'm glad he said that, because this went from something that probably made people think that he was just a hateful boomer into someone who just needed something to blame. And that effectively is what this is all about. They lost what they loved and they needed something, anything to just point the finger at. And unfortunately, it was Skrillex. Perhaps the saddest and most depressing truth about what happened with dubstep is that the dubstep music we liked, just like every other piece of art, was a specific product of its time and place, which was never meant to last forever. It's just that we didn't realize it had a lifespan until it was over. And again, this is more importance, is that something you will love will effectively not last forever. You need to enjoy the moment, get the memories, and effectively it will move on. As usually happens with a bit of time and perspective, those things that once made me feel bitter have given way to stronger feelings of nostalgia and thankfulness to have been part of something bigger than myself for those formative years of my life. Although the dubstep records I listened to between 2007 and 2010 were not consequential for the trajectory the sound would take as a whole, they were very consequential for me as a person. Making and listening to dubstep beats was something that encouraged me to share parts of myself with the world through art. And I think that impulse has never really died. Mm. It's what makes me upload vids to YouTube now. I also remember that the surprise of learning that Iconica, one of my favorite producers in the scene, was actually a woman, was the first event in a series which led me to question some of the teenage boy assumptions I'd had about men and women, what kind of art they make, which itself was a catalyst for me starting to think about society in a different way and forming my political beliefs. And it sounds weird to say it, but every genre of music I listen to now in 2021 has a pathway which links it back to my dubstep years. Hearing Flow Down on Skang led me to Roll Deep, then Trim, then Flirt D and the whole of the UK grime scene. Hearing Zombie play with wonky beats led me to seek out artists like Flying Lotus and consequently LA beats as a subgenre of hip hop. And the first time I ever heard Joanna Newsom's voice was on a bootleg by 16-bit, which then led me on to discovering a whole world of amazing folk music. People like Sufjan Stevens, Pascal Pinon and Alice Bowman, 
who've become the soundtrack to my more recent adult years. And this is effectively what I was talking about. Again, the question arises, was it you that evolved out of dubstep or did dubstep evolve away from you? That's the kind of the thing that I don't think he knows which was the right answer. But that being said, his love for that music evolved him into liking different styles of music. And obviously you grow to like different styles of music. My taste went from, I would, will never ever listen to anything other than death metal, hardcore, grindcore metal, to liking drum and bass, to effectively being a dubstep artist. But these days I still listen to some of the old music I used to like i still listen to things like coldplay and i love ed sheeran but i also love a whole manner of music as you get older you evolve musically with your taste no matter how my music taste changes between now and the point where i'm an old man all roads will always lead back to dubstep for me mm. experiencing music is such a weird thing because the impact it has on you depends entirely on how it finds you and perhaps more importantly when it finds you it just so happens that dubstep found me at a time when I was still working out who I wanted to be. And so it ended up playing a much bigger role in shaping my musical tastes and sensibilities than it could have done if I was hearing Digital Mystics for the first time today. I imagine there's a genre of music like this out there for everyone. One which, no matter how much time passes, you still feel this glowing connection to. Dubstep will always be that for me. The biggest passion I've ever had, the best hobby I've ever had, but most importantly, my musical origin story. And there it is, boys. And I think something to take away from this is enjoy your youth, quite honestly. I think there's a whole bigger message within this whole video itself. I don't think it's to blame anyone. I don't think it is actually to say, I hate Skrillex for what he did. I think this whole thing expands into a much bigger story and a much bigger message, which is enjoy your youth. Love what you do. Love what you get into. One day you will grow up and your origins will shape you. Just love yourself and love life. But anyway, guys, uh, that is my reaction. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, I will see you next time. And uh, maybe we'll do some more reactions. Who knows? Fun case out.